Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right. It's much, much, much better. It's a little uh, cloudy and dreary outside, but it's going to be sunshine in here in the house of the Lord. Amen. Please stand and join us. House of the Lord. about that this morning. I said, we look like we're working really hard up here, and we probably do, but we're really happy to be here, honestly, even if our face don't show it. <laughs> Hope you're happy to be here, too. Let's continue with every hour. Lord, you know me, and you always will. Oh, you keep me, yeah, you hold me close. Like your mercies in the morning still, you surround me and all I know is every hour a 
of every day. Oh, I need you, Lord, and that will never change. In every moment, in every way. Oh, I need you, Lord, and that will never change. Oh, that will never change. change in every moment in every way oh I need you Lord and that will never change faithful that's who you are more than able to care for my Good morning. It's good to see you all here today. I want to welcome you to Barry's Grove Baptist Church. I want to especially welcome those of you who are our guests. We're glad that you are here with us today, and I pray that you feel welcome and blessed as you are here. And uh, if you got a welcome packet when you got here, I hope you'll fill out the card and drop an offering plate on your way out because we'd love to get to know you. Uh, but we're thankful that you're here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity we have to gather together to worship you because, Lord, we do need you every hour of every day. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, our worship here today would extend to every hour of every day beyond today. Lord, that our worship would not just be something that is confined to a Sunday morning, um, but that we will worship you each and every day uh, out of the gratitude of our hearts for what you have done to us, done for us by sending your Son, Jesus Christ to die on a cross to save us from our sins. Lord, I pray that as we worship you today, you would be honored and glorified. I pray that as we worship you, our lives would be changed and brought in line uh, with the life of Christ. So Lord, we pray that everything that is said and done and every song that is sung in this service today will glorify you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We continue in our study of the book of Exodus. Uh, last week we talked about how God is always at work, even when we can't see it, and uh, how he has to get our attention sometimes, uh, so that, and uses some pretty difficult circumstances in our lives to get our attention, so that we will join him in what he's doing. We're going to see a, a picture of that today, and what God did in the life of Moses uh, in Exodus 3. So uh, our memory verse from last week was Exodus 2, memory verse says, 
Exodus 2, verses 24 and 25. So let's see if you can say that with me. God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God saw the Israelites, and God knew. Now, what a beautiful promise that is to us. God heard, he remembered, he saw, and he knew. Now, that's something that we can all take with us. No matter what our situation is, we know that God hears us when we cry out to him. We know that he remembers the promises he has made to us in Christ. We know that he sees us in the midst of our troubles, and he knows what we need. And that's a very comforting thought for us to take. So Eric's going to come get us started by reading our New Testament passage. All right, we'll be in John chapter 8 this morning. If you would like to turn there and follow along, we're going to be looking at the end of the, uh, the chapter. The last section there, beginning with verse 48 and going through verse 59. So John chapter 8, beginning in verse 48. The Jews responded to him, Aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? I do not have a demon, Jesus answered. On the contrary, I honor my father and you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and judges. Truly, I tell you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Then the Jews said, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died and so did the prophets. You say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you claim to be? If I glorify myself, Jesus answered, my glory is nothing. My father, about whom you say he is our God, he is the one who glorifies me. You do not know him, but I know him. If I were to say I don't know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews replied, You aren't 50 years old yet, and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus was hidden and went out of the temple. So we look in this, this passage today, and again, we see the, the religious leaders in, uh, involved in confrontation with, with Jesus, and uh, they don't know what to do with Jesus. They don't know what to do with his teaching and all the things he's doing, so they just accuse him here of having a demon in him. You have a demon. That's why you say the things you say and do the things you do, and Jesus answers, I, I don't have a demon. Instead, I'm honoring my Father, and it's not about me seeking my own glory. There is one who seeks it and judges. And then he says, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. So if Jesus was trying to de-escalate the situation, he chose the wrong words. Okay? So, so they accuse him of having a demon, and now he's saying that if anybody does what I say, they won't have to, to worry about death. Now, we know that, that Jesus is talking about eternal death. Right, We will face a, a death in this life, but then have eternal life thereafter if, if we know him, if we are in him, if we have a relationship with Jesus as Lord and Savior. But he is talking about eternal death that we will not have to face if we abide in him. And so the Jews answer that and they say, that, that well, now you've settled it. We know you have a demon because Abraham died, the prophets died, who are you if you're saying that, that we won't um, die? The one who keeps your word will not die. Who do you claim to be? And so then Jesus, he, he says, um, my father is God. He's the one who glorifies me. And then he calls them a bunch of liars. He said, if I were to say I don't know him, I would be a liar like you. And then he said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. 
Now, this phrase, Abraham rejoiced, that, that was actually a, a common thing with rabbinical teaching. The, the Jews would have recognized that phrase, but they generally used it to talk about God's promise being fulfilled with Abraham in, in the birth of his son, Isaac. So to hear about the rejoicing of Abraham was to speak of God's covenant promise. And yet Jesus is using it here to talk about how Abraham rejoiced, not to see Isaac coming, not to see the birth of his son, but to see the coming of Jesus, to see Christ in his day. Your father Abraham rejoiced, and he was glad. And the Jews replied, you aren't 50 years old yet, and you've seen Abraham? Okay, so Jesus talking about Abraham. Abraham would have come around 2,000 years before Jesus give or take, depending on different timelines you look at, and at least 40 generations before Jesus, if you go by the genealogy given in Matthew. So Abraham was a long time before Jesus. And uh, so the, the Jews are saying, you're not even 50 years old yet, which they would have con considered to be the age you, you really reached uh, maturity and would have more authority in what you were saying. Um, you're not even 50 yet. Jesus is probably in his 30s right here. Um, you aren't 50 years old yet, and you've seen Abraham? And they turn his words around a little bit. He wasn't saying that, that he had seen Abraham. He was saying Abraham had seen him, right? Abraham saw him. He rejoiced to, to see his day. And Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say before Abraham was, was I was. Like, I was already there. It doesn't say what it says in the, the, the Bible that the Jehovah's Witnesses use, where it says, before Abraham was, I have been, just indicating that Jesus is older than Abraham. That's not what he's saying. Jesus is saying he is eternal. Jesus is saying he is divine. He's saying, Let, let's get everything else out of the way. I am identifying with God undeniably right here. They would have clearly understood that. They did clearly understand that because we see their reaction. They picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus was hidden and went out of the temple. Jesus is identifying with the covenant name of God, Yahweh. God, as he revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush, where Craig is going to be in uh, today's sermon. Jesus, he has been hinting at this some throughout the book of John. He's, we, we've got the I am statements and John, this is, this is very intentional. Just like um, John's gospel starts out with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's meant to take us back to Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's intentional there. Jesus is being intentional here. Jesus has given I, I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. All of those have come before this. And then after this, I am the true vine. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But here, Jesus is very pointed. I am, full stop. I am God. I am eternal. I was I am right now, and I always will be. Jesus is showing his divinity. And you've got to at least give, or at least I give, the, the religious leaders credit because they did what they were supposed to do if Jesus was, was lying in that moment. They picked up stones to throw at him because the penalty for blasphemy is death by stoning. So if, if Jesus were claiming to be God and he were not, he should have been stoned right there. But it says he was hidden. We don't know what that means. We just know that that, that means they went to stone him, and all of a sudden he wasn't there in front of them anymore. Um, but we know. We know because of the, the testimony of Scripture. We know because of the testimony of so many people. We know because of his work in our own lives personal testimony, if you know him. We know that Jesus is telling the truth right here. There is one God existing in three persons. Jesus, the Son, is right here in this passage. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is identifying as God. So as we go into this time of, of prayer, this prayer focus, who wants to think about I, th I think we would say, yes, we agree that Jesus is God. But like the religious leaders right here, 
they went to take action in response to what Jesus had said. If we believe what Jesus said was true, that he is God, do we live our lives according to that realization, according to that truth, in, in response to who he is? Because if Jesus is God and he is my Lord and Savior, Lord of my life, have I rearranged everything in my life to be in obedience to him? He said, if you keep my word, you will never see death. Do we keep his word? Do we recognize his divinity? Do we recognize his lordship? Do we recognize what that means for us? Do we live our lives with the appropriate response to Jesus' statement right here? So that's what I want us to, to think about and to pray about this morning. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I thank you for the truth of who you are. I thank you for the truth of who Jesus is. For his full divinity, his full humanity. God, for his sacrifice on the cross, his power seen in his resurrection, his power seen in my life right now and in the lives of, of all who put their trust, put their faith in him. But God, I, I know that, that my life doesn't fully line up with the realization of who Jesus is at all times. And so for that, I ask forgiveness. And Lord, I, I pray that you would help us to do a better job of making our lives come into line with exactly who you are. And Lord, I, I pray that that truth would be expressed through our lives, through our actions, through our words. That that would be evident to everyone we come into contact with that we would give you all glory and honor and praise and testify to the truth of who you are. You are God. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Eric. we got an oldie goldie we're getting ready to sing this morning. Amazing Grace, please stand and join us.
Amen. Don't you? Amen. He is amazing grace. Amen. He is worthy also.
he's worthy, y'all. He really is. Amen. Can't sing that song without crying. Thank you, praise team. I mean, I guess I should make us turn to the book of Revelation since we sang half of it in that song. You know, that song is set up, in case you're wondering why it has all those questions, it's set up like a catechism. That's what it is. So it's teaching you biblical truth by answering questions based on the Word of God. Uh, it's a way of, it's the way that the church used to educate people about the Bible. Somewhere along the lines, we lost that, but it's still... Uh, very, very useful, and, uh, and it's a great song, so appreciate that. You know, I will confess that I use George Washington too much in my sermon illustrations, but man, I just don't know of many people, and I mean in modern day, and I consider modern day to be anything past biblical times, that, uh, that I respect more. Uh, he's certainly the greatest leader, I think, the world has ever seen. And, uh, but you know what's so impressive about George Washington was not just his leadership ability, it was his humility. Uh, George Washington never felt adequate for the responsibility that he was given uh, by this nation. But he took it upon himself out of a desire to serve because he loved his country, he loved his people, and he believed that God would give him the resources that he needed to complete the work that he was given to do. I believe that's reflected in a portion of his first inaugural address to Congress. This is in 1789. He says, and I realize this is difficult language to understand, but I think you'll get what I'm talking about. Among the vicissitudes, that's a great word, incident to life, no event could have filled me with greater anxieties than that of which the notification was transmitted by your order and received on the 14th day of the present month. So he's got anxiety about what they've asked him to do. On the one hand, I was summoned by my country, whose voice I can never hear but with veneration and love. On the other hand, the magnitude and difficulty of the trust to which the voice of my country called me, being sufficient to awaken the wisest and most experienced of her citizens, a distrustful scrutiny into his qualifications could not but overwhelm with despondence one who, inheriting inferior endowments from nature and unpracticed in the duties of civil administration, ought to be peculiarly conscious of his own deficiencies. Isn't that interesting? He says... Y'all should know better than ask me because I ain't got nothing. That's what he said. He just said a lot fancier than that. He said he was not up to the task that he had been asked to do, and they should have been able to look at him and see that. He goes on to say, All I dare hope is that if, in executing this task, I have been too much swayed by a grateful remembrance of former instances or by an affectionate sensibility to this transcendent proof of the confidence of my fellow citizens, and have thence too little consulted my incapacity as well as disinclination for the weighty and untried cares before me, that my error will be palliated by the motives which mislead me, and its consequences be judged by my country with some share of the partiality in which they originated. In other words, if I mess up, cut me some slack. That's what he said. Isn't that interesting? a man that we consider to be the father of our nation who not only led us to victory in the war, but also led us through the framing of our nation, uh, he did not think that he was adequate for the task. It's interesting. That's the kind of leader we need today. <laughs> we don't need the one that thinks they're good enough for it. We need the one that thinks they're not good enough for it. And then maybe that they would depend on God a little bit more to actually do their job. Uh, but I believe Washington is a man we can all emulate. He was not just great in his own eyes. He earned the respect of people through his humble service. You know, I bet there everybody sitting here today probably wonders what qualities we possess that would make us worthy to serve God. I mean, it's one thing to run for a public office or do whatever, but we're talking about serving the God of the universe. What qualities would we possess? 
within ourselves to make us worthy to be able to do that. You know, we talked last week about God was fulfilling his promises to the people of Israel and how he was preparing the one who was going to lead them out of Egypt. God is always working even when we can't see it. And that was the case with Moses. Forty years in the wilderness tending sheep, God was preparing him for the task of leading a million people out of slavery. Moses is an example of what God can do through ordinary people like us. But Moses' own self-doubt also reminds us that while humility is good and we should be humble, it is not an excuse for getting out of what God has called us to do. There are many people who will not embark on the adventure that God calls them to out of feigned humility rather than trusting that he is going to be able to accomplish his purpose through them. I believe Moses' encounter here is a model of what happens when God calls us to follow him and we trust him to do the work through us. Have you encountered God? I mean, we're going to see Moses have a direct encounter with God. Have you encountered God? Have you heard his call on your life? And here's a better question. Have you been rejecting his call? Have you been rejecting the call that he places on your life out of fear? See, I want you to understand something. Who you are, if I get to that, I'll come back to that. Who you are and what you can become are contingent on who God is and whether you trust him to lead you. Who you are and what you can become are contingent on who God is and whether you trust Him to lead you. And when I say what you can become, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about how you can become great. I'm talking about what you can become in Christ. A person who looks like Him, who serves others like Him. Folks, I hope that you'll respond to His call today. I hope that you'll trust him to lead you where he would have you to go and to mold you into the person that he would have you to be. All right, I'm going to go back to our memory verse, Exodus 3. We'll be reading the whole chapter. I'll go ahead and get you to say the memory verse with me, and uh, you'll see how it connects with what Eric was talking about earlier. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. It's Exodus 3.14. We'll talk about what all that means in a minute, but you can already see the connection that Jesus had with this passage that we see before us. Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. By the way, he was called Ruel in chapter 2. Now he's called Jethro. It could have been a family name. He could have had two names. Doesn't matter. Same father-in-law. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. As Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire but was not consumed. So Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come closer, he said. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he continued, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt and have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their sufferings and I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The territory of the Canaanites, Hethites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. So because the Israelites' cry for help has come to me, and I've also seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses asked God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He answered, I will certainly be with you, and this will be the sign to you that I am the one who sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. Then Moses asked God, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? What should I tell them? 
God replied to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. Go and assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me and said, I have paid close attention to you and to what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised you that I will bring you up from the misery of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, Hethites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. They will listen to what you say. Then you, along with the elders of Israel, must go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Now please let us go on a three-day trip into the wilderness so that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. However, I know that the king of Egypt will not allow you to go, even under force from a strong hand. But when I stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles that I will perform in it, after that he will let you go. And I will give these people such favor with the Egyptians that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. Each woman will ask her neighbor and any woman, st woman staying in her house for silver and gold jewelry and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters, so you will plunder the Egyptians. Let us pray. Lord, as we look at your word today, I pray that you would help us to see who we can be in Christ. Lord, that we would not be content with uh, the drab routine of our lives, seeking our own desires, but that we would seek that work that you have for us to do for your kingdom by your power and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. There are two things we discover when we have an encounter with God and he calls us to serve him. First, we are made aware of our deficiency. We're made aware of our deficiency. So, meanwhile, that word there at the beginning of chapter 3 reminds us that God was busy preparing to do something about the suffering of his people. Remember, the last thing we saw was that God heard, God remembered, God saw, and God knew. So, meanwhile, he's got work going on over in Midian. Now, Moses has taken the flock. He's gone way west. He's probably not in Midian anymore. He's in the Sinai Peninsula. Midian over there on the edge of the Arabian Peninsula. And he crossed over on a little isthmus or whatever you call that little piece of land that kind of bridges between two gulfs crosses over, goes west, he ends up at a place called Horeb, which is called the Mountain of God. It's called the Mountain of God because that's where God would appear to Moses, not once, but twice. We're going to see him come back to that same mountain, and it's going to be called Mount Sinai, and the people are going to worship there. But I'm getting ahead of myself because that's also in this passage. But I want you to understand, it's the same mountain. So he's taking the sheep out. He goes out, goes into this far place, ends up at this mountain, and it is the mountain of God. So, before Moses could meet with God, God had to get his attention. He had to awaken him out of his dull routine. Could you imagine tending sheep for 40 years in the wilderness? It's the same thing every day. You know, used to people would get a job and they would work somewhere for 40 or 50 years till they retired, Right? You realize the average stay at a job now uh, is like, it's like two or three years. People change jobs all the time. You know why? Because nobody likes routine. We all want something new. We want something different. We want something exciting. Well, let me tell you, 40 years of shepherding sheep in the wilderness is about the most boring routine you could ever get, right? It's the same thing every day. So one day Moses is tending the sheep, and the next thing you know, he looks, and there's a bush that's on fire. Now, that's not a big deal in the desert, right? Bushes caught fire all the time in the desert. But there was something different about this bush. It was burning, but it wasn't burning up. Something was wrong. Something was different. And he said, I've got to go see what is going on with this bush. God got his attention. Has God ever gotten your attention? Does God ever do something in your dull routine of a day that gets your attention and draws you to him? Because that's what he was doing with Moses, and I guarantee he's doing it for you every day if you just pay attention. God is trying to get your attention. So he gets Moses' attention, he draws him over to this bush, and it says that 
the angel of the Lord was in that bush. Isn't that weird? The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the bush. Now, there, we really could trace all the appearances of the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. And what you'll discover is that every time it says the angel of the Lord, it's the Lord. Because notice that it says later, it says God called out to him from the bush there in verse 4. So it says the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire, but then God spoke. So this angel of the Lord spoke as God, not as a representative of God, but as God himself. Now many scholars think that when it says the angel of the Lord and there's an appearance such as this, it's a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. So before Jesus became flesh, that he actually came to earth several times and appeared to people as the angel of the Lord. And you could interpret that. See that word angel. We get a lot of weird things in our mind when we think about angels. The word angel just means messenger. Jesus was clearly the messenger for his father. He was God, but he was also the messenger for God because he said, I only speak the words that I hear my father say. I only do the things that I see my father do. So it really would not be a shocker if this was Christ that Moses was dealing with at the burning bush, especially since he announces himself as I am, and Jesus uses those exact words in the passage that we saw earlier when he's talking to the Pharisees. You know, but bottom line here is, when we sees the fire burning in this bush and not consuming it, what he sees is the powerful and consuming presence of God. Hebrews 12, 29 says, For our God is a consuming fire. Now here's the interesting thing about the power of God in what we see in the bush, is not only was it powerful and consuming, but it was also preserving. It preserved that bush so that the bush did not burn up. So we see a magnificent picture of God's power here. We think about the power of fire, and we think about, you know, Dave just got back from uh, Maui where they had all those fires, and he showed me some pictures of the devastation that were there. So we know what the power of fire is. So when you think about that, we know that God is a consuming fire. We understand that his power is like no other. And that's what Moses came face to face with at that bush. He recognized this was a remarkable sight. He needed to go over. He needed to check it out. But when God saw that he had gotten Moses' attention, he called Moses by name. Now think about this. You're walking out in the desert with your sheep for the umpteenth millionth day of your life in the desert, and there's a bush burning. It's not burning up. I'm going to go check it out, and the bush starts talking. And the bush knows your name. Moses. Moses. It calls to him. Now, I don't know what I would have done if I had heard a bush talk to me. I might have taken off running. But to Moses' credit, he presents himself as a servant. He says, here I am. Here I am. It makes me think of Isaiah. When Isaiah encountered God, then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, who will I send? Who will go for us? I said, here I am. Send me. That's the posture we should all have when God calls to us, when God calls our name, when he invites us to join in his work like he's getting ready to do Moses. We need to be prepared to humble ourselves and say, here I am, send me, do with me what you will. So I want to ask you, are you paying attention to God's activity around you? Are you listening for when he's calling your voice or he's trying to get you to listen to him? How do you respond when he calls you? Do you run away or do you present yourself to him to ready to listen and obey? Well, God warned Moses, don't come any closer and take your shoes off. And taking your shoes off in that culture was a sign of respect. It was a sign of reverence. We know Muslims today still all take their shoes off when they go to pray uh, at the mosque. And uh, most of them take them off before they go in the house. So uh, uh, it, was a, it was a way of showing respect. And the reason was the place was holy. It was holy. He says it's holy ground. The place where you're standing is holy ground. Now I want you to understand that was just a piece of desert. There was nothing special about that ground, just as there's nothing special about the ground on which we stand today. The difference between patches of ground is where God is. Because wherever God is, it makes that place holy. So if two or three are gathered together in His name, then this place becomes holy. 
Does it not? If the Holy Spirit is dwelling in your heart and God's presence is within you, then that would, by nature, make you holy. Holy. Now, I want you to understand something when we think about this. You know, we are not holy unless God makes us holy. So we're in a different situation from Moses because Moses had no way in that day to be made holy out of the sacri- outside of the sacrificial system, which had not even actually been instituted yet. It was only by faith, trusting in a covenant promise of Abraham, of which they, even then, were not practicing. I want you to think about us, because see, we have a way to be able to be brought near to God because of Christ. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. What was the curtain? The curtain was the veil that separated the rest of the temple from the holy place, where only the high priest could go once a year to offer the sacrifice to bring forgiveness for the whole nation. Right? The Day of Atonement. That was the only time he could go in there. But Christ tore away the veil so that we could come into the presence of God. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. So I want you to understand, we can approach God. We can approach God because Jesus has made a way. However, we should never take that for granted. Think about what 1 Peter 1 says, but as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. So what does that mean? That means that we need to be careful about how we live our lives if we plan to approach God. Whether we plan to enter into his presence to ask for forgiveness or for help or whatever, or if he has called us to serve him and he calls us into his presence to commission us We must be careful that we are living in such a way that honors Him. Folks, if we are serious about encountering God and experiencing life with Him, then we must adjust our lives to Him. We should not just brazenly burst into God's presence and demand of Him what we think we need or what we think we should do. And I dare say that's how a lot of our prayer lives are. We just bust into God's presence and we go, God, I don't know why you're letting this happen in my life, but you need to do something about it. God, I don't know why you let my beloved uh, you know, sister, brother, mother, father, son, daughter, whoever gets sick, but you better do something about it. I don't think we understand that God is holy. He is separate. He is distinct from all other things. And everything that he touches, everywhere that he is, also becomes holy. So to walk in his presence with some kind of proud and dignified, brazen sin in our lives is going to bring wrath from God. Because he is a consuming fire. Right? So we we must prepare ourselves. We must be careful about the way that we live our lives if we are going to serve God this great God. Well, God begins his call on Moses' life by telling him who he is. He's the God who made the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we're talking about over 500 years before he had made this covenant with the patriarchs of his people, the Israelites. Notice he doesn't say that he was their God, but that he still is. Just like what Eric talked about earlier, before Abraham was, I am. He says, I am their God. But here, the interesting thing is, he's saying in the present tense as in, they're still alive. Well, let's think about that because Jesus uses this very passage to make that point in Luke 20 when he was talking to the Sadducees because Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. He said, Moses even indicated in the passage about the burning bush that the dead are raised where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, because all are living in him. Isn't that awesome? You know, that's what gives us hope of the resurrection. That's what gives us hope when we come to funerals of loved ones who have died in the faith. We know that they are still alive with him because he is the God of the living and not God of the dead. Folks, what an encouragement that should be to us. But we must trust him for that. It's not something to be taken lightly. When we enter into his presence, this God who is the God of the living, this God who is holy, this God who calls us 
to serve him in humble obedience. Moses wouldn't even look at his face, right? Or Moses wouldn't look at the fire directly. He hid his face. I mean, think about it now. This wasn't even the full presence of God. It was just an appearance of a a symbol of God. God didn't appear to him in his full form. We know he does later when he comes back to that mountain, but he wouldn't let Moses look at his front side. Moses asked, can I see your face? He said, no one looks at my face and lives. But you can see my backside when I'm coming through. That's it. Think about this. This is a holy God that we're dealing with here. And this holy God wants to have a relationship with us. And this holy God actually wants to use us to do something meaningful with our lives. And yet we run around chasing after things that don't have any meaning and think that somehow we're going to find purpose in those things. How ridiculous of us. How ridiculous of us to think that we can find our hope in anything else. Well, God tells Moses what he wants to do with him. And Moses is like, what? He tells Moses, I'm going to send you. He said, I've heard my people crying out, just like we saw at the end of chapter 2. He said, I'm going to bring them to a good and spacious land. It was good because he says it was flowing with milk and honey, which means it was rich in resources. He says it's spacious because there were six nations currently living there. And that means there was plenty of room for this, this huge family now to spread out and to grow. Now, I want you to think about this. Now, this is 500 years since he made this promise to Abraham. I want you to think about this for a second. In, in Genesis 15, God promised Abraham that in the fourth generation, now he's already talked about they're going to be enslaved, talking about Abraham's descendants. He says in the fourth generation, they will return here, talking about the promised land where Abraham was living at the time. For the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. There's two things we see in that. We see the holiness of God, and we see the grace of God. Okay. So God was ready to fulfill his promise, that covenant he made with Abraham, because it was finally time to punish the Canaanites. Amorites is just another word for Canaanites, and it it was, in effect, it was six tribes, and they were often just known by the title Amorites or Canaanites. It was all these six tribes, six, six nations, and he gave them 500 years to repent. Think about that. He made a promise to Abraham. He said, I'm going to give you this land, but not until their sin has reached a point where I have to punish them. So my, in my holiness, I must punish their sin because it has reached a level where it cannot be allowed to go on. But I'm going to be gracious to them, and I'm going to give them this much time to turn away from their sin. Now think about it. That's how God deals with us, isn't it? God has to deal with our sin, but he certainly is gracious and patient with us. And that's a wonderful thing for us to remember. Well, God tells him, so I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. Now, I want you to think about this. Moses had gone to live in Midian because he ran away from Egypt because he killed a man. And the current king had wanted to put him to death for it. He's been out there tending sheep in the wilderness, and none of his people knows where he's at for 40 years. He has been totally forgotten. That king died, another king's come to power. They've forgotten all about Moses. And now God is telling him, go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh, and you're going to bring my people out of Egypt. And Moses is like, what? (laughs) He says, who am I? Who am I? Am I that I could ever do something like that? How could I possibly be equipped to lead a nation of over a million people away from the strongest king at the time on the face of the earth? It's a good question. (laughs) But see, it wasn't about Moses. It was about God. And when God calls us to do something for him, It's not about the great qualities or strengths or skills that we have. It's about the God who lives in us and wants to work through us. Walter Kaiser made a great statement. He said, once again, God was about to use a person who was keenly aware of his own defects and who sought no advantage or position over others. 
Now, I want you to think about something. Moses had tried to assert his power and authority, and it got him in trouble the first time. He killed the Egyptian, and he hit him and thought he wouldn't get found out. Then he tried to break up a fight between his own people and be a mediator between them, and they didn't want to listen to him. He was trying to get position in his own power, and it didn't work out. Now, he's not so self-assured anymore. Now, he realizes, I don't have the ability to do this. I'm not equipped for this kind of thing. And God said, it's okay. I'm going to do it, and you're going to watch. <laughs> you're going to be privy to see what great things that I can do with you. And here's the thing, he can do that with each one of us. The problem is most of us aren't seeking God's purpose for our lives. We're chasing after our own purpose, and it leads us to constant disappointment. You know, Everybody Loves Raymond was a, a show that I really used to love to watch. Still watch it on reruns sometimes. And uh, Ray Romano, the lead character, said this after the series was over. He said, right after Raymond, I had a world is my oyster attitude, but I found out I don't like oysters. I had this existential emptiness. What is my purpose? Who am I? I had a big identity crisis. Later, he took this issue up with his therapist and said, he told his therapist, why can't I just sit back and be happy? And he says, well, first of all, I need to make a living. That's what the therapist said to him. <laughs> you see, therapists stay in business because there are a lot of people like Ray and us who are out there trying to figure out why we're here. And here's the thing. The answers to these questions can only be found in an encounter with God. That's the only place we're ever going to find the question, uh, the answer to the question of who am I? As we meet him and he reveals his purpose for our lives, which is bound up in a relationship with him where we find our true identity. You see, the problem with our world is, I mean, we live in a day of, uh, of a crisis of identity. I mean, that's why we have the transgender issues that are going on. People don't know who they are anymore. And they don't know where to look to find the answers for those questions. So they look within themselves. And when you look within yourself, you're going to find something you don't like. Right? right? See, our identity crisis is it's fixed when we find our identity in God. You can only know who you truly are when you know the God who created you. And only he knows exactly what he designed you to be and to do. So folks, if you're out there and you're struggling around trying to figure out why you're here on this big blue marble, understand that it is God who holds the key to the purpose of your life. The second thing we discover when we encounter God and he calls us to serve him is that he promises to be our sufficiency. You see, where we are deficient, he is sufficient. That's key for us to understand. Whatever I am lacking in, he will more than make up for out of his great and eternal resources. So God promises Moses that he would be with him when he faced Pharaoh and led Israel out of Egypt. He says, I will certainly be with you. And then he gives them a sign. He says, this will be the sign to you that I am the one who sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. Now, I want you to think about that. First of all, he says, I will certainly be with you. Now, remember, this is the God who just claimed to be the God who made the covenant promise with Abraham over 500 years ago. He's also the same covenant God who called Moses out of 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, tending sheep. He is the God who has already said what he's going to do for his people because he's been listening to their groaning under the struggle. He spoke to Moses out of a burning bush. Isn't it just, doesn't it just make sense that he's going to have to be the one to do what he's called Moses to do? He's the one who set the purpose in motion when he made the covenant promise. He's the one who's already declared what he's going to do. He calls Moses, who doesn't have the skills to do it. Obviously, only God is the one who will be able to fulfill that promise. He's going to be with him. If God is not with Moses, it won't get done. Understand, if God is not with us, we will not be able to accomplish his purpose either. We do not have the skills that are necessary to do the things that God wants us to do. It's only by His power 
for His glory. If we could do it in our own power, then we could take all the glory for ourselves. But ultimately, God uses broken vessels like us so that His glory can shine through. That's the key of what we see in the story of Moses. Moses was just a vessel God was going to use to accomplish His good purpose for His people. Now think about this whole thing. He says, I will certainly be with you. When he says, I will certainly be with you, we know that in the Old Testament, you know, if you do a big overview of the Old Testament, what you'll see is that the Holy Spirit came on certain people at certain times for certain things. Right? They didn't all have the Holy Spirit. They didn't all have access to God. In fact, they had to go through the priests to get to God. That's how they worshipped. So there was a difference when God was with them. It's not the same as it is today. It all changed with Jesus. When he says in Matthew 1, 23, See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. They will name Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. So when Jesus came to earth, he brought the very presence of God to this place. Well, to Israel. He didn't come here, unless you're a Mormon, and then maybe he did. But he came to Israel, and he walked around, and he took the presence of God with him everywhere he went. But then I want you to understand something. It got better when he left. Didn't Jesus say it's to your advantage that I go away? Because when I go away, I'm going to send my spirit back. That's why Jesus could say in Matthew 28, 20, at the end of the Great Commission, the part that we seem to forget sometimes is, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So he's gone, but now he's with us in a way that he's never been before. Because the Holy Spirit comes into the heart's and lives of believers, so that everywhere we go, He is with us. And you know what that means? That means that everywhere we go, we can do what He's called us to do. Because He's there. He's empowering us to do things that are beyond our ability, so that He gets the glory and draws people to Himself. That's what He's doing. That's what He wants to do in your life. It's what He wants to do in my life. Yep. So, we... Uh, we think about that. We have a distinct advantage over Moses. We have a distinct advantage over Moses. But he promises Moses a sign. Now, generally, you think of a sign as something you see before something happens. I mean, I think about Jesus gave signs of his return, and he talked about those signs. When you see this, when you see this, when you see this, and we're beginning to see signs, right? We're beginning to see signs. We don't know how long there is a gap between those signs and when the end will actually come, but he says these are signs, and we see signs. But he gives Moses a sign that he won't get to see until it's over. <laughs> until his mission is complete, technically not complete, but the initial part of the mission that God is talking about here will not be, it will be complete when he sees this sign. He says that they are going, this is the sign that when you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. So we're talking about Moses has to go and do what God has called him to do in leading the nation of Israel out of the nation of Egypt to come all the way back into the wilderness to worship. That's going to be a sign. In other words, when it's over, you'll know it. <laughs> when it's over, you'll know it. It was a sign that had to be received by faith. Now that's where it gets hard for us. Because we're always asking God for a sign, aren't we? I still, you know, I'm, I'm still never going to stop using this illustration. But in the Sunday school class, many, 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 many moons ago, before I was the pastor here... One young man who was quite obnoxious suggested that God should give everyone a sign. It's him. God should get every, give everyone a sign like he gave to uh, Mary when she was going to give birth to Jesus. That you know, God should just drop a billboard and tell us what he wants us to do. And I reminded Eric that we're not as important as Mary. <laughs> we're not giving birth to the Son of God. We don't need the same signs that she needed. That was pretty important. Uh, but here's the thing. God has given us a sign. He's given us plenty of signs. He's given us plenty of promises of what is going to happen when it's all over. And what we're doing is we're trusting in what we see by faith to get us through today. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm focused on the finish line, and I'm trusting step by step that God's going to guide me there. Because first of all, I don't know how to get there. And I don't know what way there is to get there. So I have to trust. So it's a matter of faith. 
Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. Moses had no way of seeing how this was going to happen. He's looking at an impossible task of, convicting, uh, of, of convincing the greatest king in the world in that day that he should let a million people that he had enslaved go free. He had no way of seeing how that was possible. So he had to trust that God was able to do what he had called him to do. Now, now I want you to think about this. We're following God to a place we do not know where it is or how to get there. But then we think about what Jesus said to Thomas. Thomas, one of the disciples. We call him Doubting Thomas. I call him Thomas who asks good questions. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Man, that was a legitimate question when he asked Jesus that. Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you so that, so that where I am, there you can be also. And I'm going to come back and take you there to be with me. And they're like, where, what? If we had been there, we'd have been Thomas. I don't have any idea what you're talking about, Jesus. And I certainly don't know how to get there. And then Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see... Following him by faith is not so much about a certain way that we must go, as in whether to go to the right or whether to go to the left, but that he himself is the way. It's so hard to understand. It's not about where we're going. It's not about a place. It's about a person. It's about a relationship. He is developing a relationship whereby we learn to trust him to lead us and depend on his presence step by step. Each and every day of our lives. Here's the bottom line. It's not so much about where we go or what we do as it is about who we are with when we go and when we do. Moses understood he didn't need to go do it by himself. He knew that he needed the presence of this God that he had just formally met for the first time. And so he asked God, what do I tell the Israelites when they ask me who sent who sent me? It's a legitimate question. Moses is going to go down there, and most of these people are going to have no idea who he is. They're not going to remember him. And the ones who do will go, oh, yeah, you're the guy that killed the Egyptian. I mean, it's not like he goes with a great reputation or an awesome resume. And he says, what am I going to tell them? Why would they ever listen to me? He needed an authority beyond his own to accomplish something that great. And we do as well when we seek to serve the Lord because we have no authority of our own to lead people out of spiritual bondage to salvation. So God tells Moses his covenant name, which in Yahweh, which is Yahweh in Hebrew, and it means I am who I am, or just I am for short. All it is is the verb to be. It's really interesting. I mean, you know, and we say Yahweh, the Jews will say, we don't know how to say it, so they don't say it at all. They didn't want to take a chance on saying his name wrong and being killed for blaspheming his name. So they won't even say it. But it's simply the verb to be. I am who I am. In other words, he is saying that he is self-existent. He is timeless. He is completely separate and distinct from all creation with power and authority over everything that he made. (laughs) I am. I always have been. I always will be. I don't need anybody. But you certainly need me. That's what he's saying. You know, it's this timeless and all-powerful God who would be with Moses. And it is this timeless and all-powerful God that is with us. And that's an awesome thing to remember. When you're out there in the world and you don't feel like you know what to do. You have the eternal God dwelling in you. If you know Christ. A.W. Tozer made a really great statement. He said, God needs no one, but when faith is present, he works through anyone. God doesn't need us, but he wants us. And when we have faith, he can work through us, even when we don't appear to be very useful. That's wonderful, because I don't know about you, but I feel really useless most of the time. Yeah, but God can use me. God can use you too. You know, Moses was a murderer and a shepherd. He had no credentials to go into Egypt and do anything. 
He was a weak and sinful person like us. But I want you to understand something. When we say, who am I? God says, I am. <laughs> you, see how he answered, you see how he answered that question that Moses asked? Moses said, who am I? God's response is, I am. <laughs> it doesn't matter who you are, Moses. All that matters is who I am. It doesn't matter who you are. All that matters is who God is in you. That is truly all that matters. He is our sufficiency for our deficiency. He is the one who fills in the empty places in us. You know, I love how uh, uh, Paul said it in 2 Corinthians 12. He was talking about, you know, he had the thorn in his flesh. We don't know what it is, which is really good because then we can apply it in any way we want, right? He had a problem. He asked God to fix it. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. So then Paul said, therefore I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So it doesn't matter what your deficiencies are, God his grace is sufficient for you, and when you are weak, He can be strong in you. He can be strong for you. So we can depend on Him. We don't have to worry about what we don't bring to the table. He's going to bring everything we need. So now this name is used in Genesis, by the way. You can find the name Yahweh in the book of Genesis, but it's never used directly as a name to be used of God. We, you know, several names of God in the Old Testament. we got Elohim and Adonai would be the two main ones, and they're used quite a bit. And you can tell, by the way, it's written in your Bible. Lord, if it's Lord in all capitals, it's Yahweh. If it's lowercase, if it's G with the lowercase O and D, then it's probably Elohim. It could be Adonai, right? So we have the different variations of God's name, but this is the covenant name. This was the name that he says he is going to be remembered by for future generations. In other words, this was the name that they were going to worship. This was the name that they were going to call on when they called on him for help. And then Moses is told that he's to go and call the leaders of Israel, and they're going to come and they're going to listen to him. That's an amazing thing because, again, who is Moses? It's not about him. It's about God. They're going to listen to Moses because of God. So he's going to call the elders together. They're going to come. They're going to listen to him. And, you know, he is going to lead them out uh, to this land of milk and honey. But what they're going to request is a three-day trip into the wilderness to sacrifice to the Lord our God. Now, we're going to see this as we progress through Exodus. He's going to start out by asking for something small. And it's going to get a little bigger, and then a little bigger, and a little bigger, until he finally says, we're going to leave, and we're taking everything with us. So initially, all they asked for was a three-day trip to go sacrifice in the wilderness. And there's two things that are important to understand about that. Uh, number one, it was giving Pharaoh a chance to say yes to something small to work him up to the larger one. What it ended up being was it just increased his suffering on the way to the bigger one. Because he wouldn't listen, he hardened his heart. We'll get to that later. But the second thing that is important about that is that they were going to worship. It wasn't just that God was setting this people free from slavery, you know, in the sense of economic slavery, so that they could go live in this land and not have to suffer the way they did. No, they were also in spiritual slavery. They had forgotten about their God. They had begun to worship the Egyptian gods. They had lost their connection with the covenant God of their forefathers. And so what God was doing was he was calling Moses to bring the people out to worship, to bring them back to him. I want you to understand something, folks. It doesn't matter what we do in this life. That's our call as well. We're to lead people to worship God whether it's believers that we help draw closer to him or whether it is lost people that need to know him, our calling everywhere we go is to be the light of the world so that people can see their way to Jesus. That's what he was calling Moses to do. That's what he's calling us to do today. But God did know Pharaoh wouldn't listen, and he told Moses that. 
He said, Pharaoh's not going to listen to you. So when Moses comes back later and we see him complain that Pharaoh wouldn't listen to him, it's, I mean, I don't know why God didn't just say, I told you so, because he did. He was trying to take away his objections right up front. I'm just telling you now, Pharaoh's not going to listen, but he's not going to listen so that I can show signs and wonders to him and prove to him how great I am. So understand, even when somebody rejects God, God uses that to glorify himself. Don't ever forget that. God is glorified in everything. God is not only glorified in the salvation of people, he's glorified in their judgment. Because it shows his holiness. It shows that he is righteous. And we should never forget that. So Pharaoh is finally going to let them go. The Israelites are going to plunder them on the way out like a defeated foe, merely by asking for the Egyptian stuff, because they're going to be so in awe of what God has done, they're going to say, take our stuff. And you know what that was? That was a preparation for taking the promised land. Because when they went to the promised land, what was going to happen? God was going to defeat the cities that they encountered and the nations that they encountered, and they were going to plunder them. And it was all going to be because of what God had done. So God is preparing them all along the way for what he was yet to do. Now, before we close, I want us to stop and think about one thing. Think about what God has said and done here. He's taken a nobody shepherd out of the wilderness who has been living in anonymity on the run from Egypt for 40 years. He introduces himself and reminds Moses of the covenant he made with his ancestors. He calls Moses to an impossible task, and then he tells him how it will play out from beginning to end. What a perfect illustration of God's sufficiency and how that is encapsulated in his name, I am. I am. It just wraps all of that up. (laughs) God says, look, I'm the one that made the covenant. I'm the one that sees what's going on now. I'm the one that's going to finish it because I was and I am and I always will be. And because of that, Moses, you can trust me. That's exactly what he's calling us to today because he never changes. Think about this beautiful picture Hebrews 13, 8 gives us. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why? Because he's the great I am and he doesn't change. So I can depend on him each and every day and I never have to worry about him turning his back on me because that goes against his nature. He's going to do everything that I need, whether I think it's what I need or not. Folks, he's working in our lives to draw us to him. He's calling us to follow and serve him today. He has a glorious plan for our future. Right? If you're here today and you're a believer, it's because God saw you and drew you to him for salvation. It's not because of anything you did. In fact, the Bible says that he chose you before the foundation of the world. Yeah. You were already his child. He just, had to, he just had to help you realize it, right? And if you're lost and you're here today, understand that you didn't come here by accident. God drew you here because he wants to call you, because he's speaking to you. You know, anytime the word of God is spoken, God is calling people. God is calling people. He's calling his people to serve and humble themselves. He's calling lost people to come and humble themselves and find salvation. But he's always calling people. The question is, how do we respond? You know, next week in chapter 4, we're going to see Moses start piling up the excuses for why he can't do it. You know, we're, we're the kind of people that do the same thing. We make excuses. We constantly duck the call of God, and we run the other way. I mean, think about Jonah. Jonah, go to Nineveh. Jonah said, nope, I'm going the other way. I'm going to Spain. <laughs> Long way from Nineveh, right? We, we, we run, and we run, and we run, and God continues to pursue, and it's time to quit running. It's time to quit running. You know, I think about my own encounter with God. We may not, I mean... I didn't have a burning bush moment with God, just as I'm sure most of us have never had anything quite that dramatic. But God is always speaking. I remember clearly the day God got my intention, attention. I had no intention of following him. I certainly would have never envisioned being a pastor. Now, here's the thing. I've talked to way more people than just me who've had a similar experience of an encounter with God. Where you came face to face with him and realized, my life's got to change. 
And I don't know what to do about it except surrender my life to him. And I'm telling you, he is still in the business of doing that today. And he may not be calling you to lead Israel out of Egypt. He may not be calling you to be a pastor, but he is calling you to follow him and to serve him wherever he leads you. That's a high calling. I don't care what it is you do. I don't care if you're cleaning toilets. I don't care if you're preaching to thousands. You can glorify God in whatever you do and lead people to him. So I want to ask you a couple questions as we close. Where, where is your focus today? Where, where, where are you going? What are you, what are you looking for in life. I love this quote from Experiencing God from our lesson for this coming week. Once I know God's will, I can adjust my life to him. The focus needs to be on God, not on my life. So the question is, where is our focus? Are we focused on our own lives or are we focused on God and what he's doing and seeing how we can adjust our lives to get in concert with him so we can work together with him? Where's your focus today? Are you just trying to figure out how to get what you want, or do you want to know God? Folks, I'd, I'd say a whole lot of us lean on that we're just trying to get what we want. We treat God like a vending machine, that he's just going to give me everything I ask for, rather than asking him, what do you want from me? Have you become consumed with your own life and turned away from your relationship with him? You know, that's real easy to do. We just lose sight of where God is in our lives and what he wants for us? Are you struggling through a difficult time in your life and forgotten that God is still there and that he cares for you? It's real easy for us to drift away during those moments and think God doesn't care about me anymore. He doesn't have a purpose for my life. Folks, I want you to understand God is calling you back to him today. If you're lost, God is calling you to come to him for the first time today. He's calling you to come to Christ who will apply the blood that he shed on the cross to your heart so that you can be forgiven of your sins, so that you can draw near to him, so that you can walk with him, so that you can serve him with your life. If you've never done that, I invite you to come and let's pray together today and ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. But if you're a believer and you're just struggling today to know what it is that God wants for your life, oh, he, he's got a plan. But he's waiting on you to seek his plan. First to seek him then to discover what it is he wants you to do as you learn to walk with him day by day. I pray that you'll do that. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. Thank you that you're always calling us back to you. Even though we are so prone to wander, Lord, we feel it. Because, Lord, we are sheep. And we get ourselves into a lot of trouble. We thank you that you're the good shepherd. That you gave your life for the sheep that you always come looking for your lost sheep. I pray that if there are any lost sheep here today, that you'll find them and bring them home. Lord, if it's someone who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that you would convict them of the truth of who you are. Lord, that they would be convicted of their sin and that they would humble themselves and ask for your forgiveness and allow you to be Lord of their lives. Lord, if there are some here today who are just struggling as believers, Lord, I pray that they would remember today that you love them, that you have a purpose for them, and that you want to use them to bring you glory. Lord, we love you and we thank you for being a God who never quits on us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us just as I am.
few announcements before we leave. Uh, this afternoon at 5 o'clock, youth group will meet in the basement. At 5.30, teen kid will meet in the Family Life Center. Tomorrow at 1 o'clock, the ladies are invited to meet in the social room for a game of bunco that I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but according to Kay Locker, it's fun. But there's a $2 entry fee, so I'm not sure what's going on. We might have to check this out, make sure we don't have any illegal gambling going on. In the, in the Family Life Center tomorrow. This guy knows that's what it sounds like. Next thing you know, he'll be dancing back there too. We're Baptist, Kay. We're Baptist. Yeah, two dollars and quarters or these dollar bills. What are we? <laughs> All right. It sounds like a good time. I'm just messing with you. Uh, so, ladies, I hope you'll come out. I, I hear they have a really good time, which makes me worry about the gambling part. But anyway. Um, I hear they have a lot of fun, so I uh, hope, hope, uh, hope you ladies will plan to attend and have a good time. Wednesday night at 7 o'clock is Experience Guy. We had a great turnout the other night. Um, you know, if you haven't joined and, and would like to, we'll, we'll, we'll let you, um, but you're going to have to find your own book because I think we ran out of those. I think we had one left is what I heard last time. Um, what? That one's gone. You got to get your own book. All right, we ran out. We ordered about 60 of those things, and they're all gone, so praise the Lord for that. Don't forget to sign up for Stu, uh, Brunswick Stu Fundraiser for, is this one for Kentucky or, yeah, this one's for Chad and Stephanie Morgan up in Kentucky. Uh, that's going to be on October 21st. Go ahead and sign up for that. Uh, next Sunday, uh, we are going to be uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper, so prepare your heart for that. We'll also be having uh, baptism for several folks. Uh, we have a new one to add to the list today. I said, you going, so are you going to do this next Sunday? She said, maybe. I said, oh, no, no, that's not how this works. <laughs> so uh, J.C. Riley has come forward to make her public profession of faith today. She, uh, unbeknownst to me, she prayed to receive Christ at camp. <laughs> See, Eric didn't know. I told you. She said, she said, Wyatt told you. But I said, if she. Okay. I didn't know any of it. So there you go. So uh, we're doesn't matter, but we're we're excited that JC has come and that she's going to be baptized, become a member of our church, and we're just glad to have you. And I know mom mom's real happy. So I hope you'll come by and speak to JC before you leave today. Just give her a word of encouragement. Let her know you'll be praying for. Her. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Have a blessed day.